we're going to continue our journey through a reflection on the Eucharist. And uh, the topic tonight is really going to be focused on uh, the theology of the Eucharist. And uh, I'm going to be relying directly upon the Catechism of the Catholic Church tonight. So I'll say a bit more about that in just a moment. Um, but we've really uh, been looking so far uh, at the history of the Eucharist, uh, the preparation for it among God's people in the Old Testament. We looked at the life of Jesus. We looked at the Last Supper. Uh, we looked at uh, the Eucharist and the earliest celebration in the, in the uh, second century with St. Justin last time. And so, um, so tonight we're going to be kind of looking at a synthetic meaning of the Eucharist. And if you've never sat down and read the Catechism of the Catholic Church that was published in 1994, it is a wonderful resource in the life of the Church. So when it first came out, um, I must admit, uh, now I do have a degree in, in theology, so you know, for me it was fascinating. I just sat down and read it cover to cover like a novel, so I really enjoyed it. But it has a great index, and it also has a great table of contents, so you can go back and find particular things you want to study about and get in depth in that area. So, the one thing I love about church documents is they always have paragraphs. So you can go find their number of paragraphs. So you can locate the exact paragraph. And so the section in the Catechism of the Catholic Church of the paragraphs written down, 1322 to 1419. So the, the primary be found in those paragraphs in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So if you happen to have one of these at home, you can read further uh, after tonight's uh, class. So, but let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, creator of all that is, we gather on this night to reflect more deeply upon the mystery of the Eucharist fullness of time, you sent your own beloved Son to be our Savior. And on that evening of the Last Supper, he gave himself to us in his body and blood as a perpetual memorial of his saving love revealed on the cross and in the resurrection. Deepen our love for this great, wondrous gift and help us to respond with deeper faith, hope, and love. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I mentioned the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, so the Church itself, um, as far as a universal catechism, uh, had not really done a comprehensive catechism in a number of centuries. And after the Second Vatican Council, um, uh, of course we had one in the United States called the Baltimore Catechism. Uh, but the Universal Catechism really went sort of back to the whole church, went back to sort of the Council of Trent, is my understanding. So, you know, the question came up after the Second Vatican Council, and we're 60 years after the convocation of that council this fall. Uh, could we once more have a catechism that would represent the church's understanding uh, in the current time in history in which we're living? And uh, there were actually some bishops and theologians that said, you know, we're beyond that point, you know, in time since the council. But Pope John Paul II uh, and a synod of bishops asked that that be done. And so there was worldwide consultation with bishops and theologians from around the planet. And under the direction of, uh, at the time, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, consulting broadly, the Catechism was developed in the mid-1990s and uh, published as the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And uh, it was an attempt to say, um, this is what we as church believe, and to be fully comprehensive. So part one has to do with all of our beliefs. There's a section on uh, sacraments, which we're going to be looking at tonight, celebration of the Christian mystery, a uh, section on living out that faith uh, in the life of Christ, which is on morality, and then finally a smaller section on prayer. 
So an attempt to comprehensively present the teachings of the Catholic Church that was promulgated by Pope John Paul II when he was Pope in 1994, I think. So uh, this is, to this date, um, in a sense, a definitive uh, guide of what the Church believes today. There have been some modifications uh, made to it under uh, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, but it's essentially 99% uh, of what it was when it was first published in 1994. So I just mentioned that by, by, by way of background. And um, the section on the Eucharist is very well done. And uh, what I've done on the whiteboard tonight is I have divided up the central sections of this section of the Catechism into Roman numerals. So um, I will begin by saying the Eucharist itself is what completes Christian initiation. So when one becomes a Christian, you're baptized. If, you're, if you've ever been to the Easter Vigil, you know this, confirmed. And receiving the Eucharist is the completion of one's Christian initiation. In it, the Catechism says we participate in the Lord's own sacrifice. And at the Last Supper, he instituted the Eucharist as the sacrament of his body and blood to perpetuate the, sacri the, the sacrifice of the cross, a memorial of his death and resurrection. So that's kind of a little concise summary. And if you've been sort of listening to my presentations all along, uh, basically that's what I've been saying. So, uh, so the, the theology of the church is expressed in a way that is reflective of how it develops in scripture. So um, I may have quoted this before, but the catechism quoting uh, the documents of the Second Vatican Council, in particular the one on the church, uh, says that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the life of the church. That means that everything we are as church comes from the Eucharist, and it's the highest moment in our life of faith. So when you think about it that way, everything else we do as church, all the other sacraments, every ministry of the church are bound up with the Eucharist and oriented toward it. And that's why I would say that when we gather to celebrate the Eucharist on the day of the Lord, whether it's the Vigil Mass on Saturday evening or on Sunday, this is the moment when we are most church. And that is when we're living out our Catholicity to its fullness. So this is the church in its full embodiment when we gather for the Eucharist. Um, the, the Catechism notes that the Eucharist contains the whole spiritual good of the church. Why? Because the Eucharist is Christ himself. So that's our entire good as a church, uh, bound up in the Eucharist. It's an effective or efficacious sign and a cause of communion of God's people. So the, un the unity of God's people is signified in the Eucharist that we celebrate together, but it also effectively brings about that communion with each other in Christ. The Eucharist culminates God's sanctification of the world. So God is acting in the Eucharist to make the world holy. And it's also the culmination of our worship offered to Christ and through him to the Father and the Holy Spirit. So there's kind of a double movement in the Eucharist. God is acting through the Eucharist to make holy the world and all of its people and we as humanity are offering our perfect worship of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit in the Eucharist. So, I will add as an aside, uh, there is no more perfect or better prayer that we as Catholics have than the Eucharist itself. It is the perfect prayer. And it contains within it, of course, the Lord's Prayer taught to us by Jesus himself. Uh, and the Catechism notes that we're already united when we celebrate Eucharist with the heavenly liturgy. So think about that. All the angels and saints forever praising, adoring, and thanking God for all eternity in the heavenly realms. When we celebrate Eucharist, we are in a real communion with that forever heavenly liturgy that's unfolding always. So that's uh, kind of a first point that the Catechism wants to make. 
It's also interesting, it does this with most of the sacraments. Well, what's the name given to it? We've already seen a lot of the names. Uh, the first one it gives is Eucharist itself, which is the Greek word for Thanksgiving. Uh, the celebration is also called the Lord's Supper, which we've heard to refer to, the breaking of the bread, which we've heard about already in the Acts of the Apostles. It's called the Eucharistic Assembly. It's called the Memorial of the Lord's Death and Resurrection. It's called the Holy Sacrifice. And you may have heard that, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. It's called uh, the Divine Liturgy. That's the Eastern name for it, like, for example, in the Byzantine churches. It's called the Sacred Mysteries, the Most Blessed Sacrament, Holy Communion, uh, and Holy Mass. And by the way, the word Mass uh, comes from the Latin Missio, which was the way the liturgy ended in Latin. Uh, it is sent. So, and the point that the Catechism makes is God's people were sent forth into the world to live out our faith and to share the gospel that we've been receiving at Mass. So that's that's where Holy Mass comes from. And lots of other smaller names, holy things, bread of angels, bread from heaven, for those who are dying for the Attica. Uh, part three, uh, the Eucharist and the economy of salvation. So what's the economy of salvation? It's kind of the work of God in time and history to save humanity. So we've been, in going through the Old Testament and then the New Testament and in the life of the church, we've essentially been reviewing the great history or economy of God's work of saving humanity. And uh, so the signs that are used, of course, are bread and wine, which become the body and blood of Christ. And um, I love the fact that the Catechism refers back to Melchizedek, whom we looked at in the book of Genesis, who brought bread and wine to Abraham. Uh, it reflects the fact that the bread and the wine are both fruits of the earth that are given back to God in gratitude at the Eucharist, but also the work of human hands. Um, and it will refer us back to the Exodus, which we spent a lot of time with, to the manna in the desert, uh, to the cup of blessing at the Passover meal, the festive joy that's signified by it. Uh, it refers to the gospel narratives of the multiplication of loaves, which we did, uh, to the wedding feast of Cana, where water is transformed into wine, uh, and also to the bread of life discourse and the gospel of John. So, uh, you know, as, as the church is, and the catechism is tracing it, it's tracing all the great narratives that we already looked at uh, when we first gathered the first evening. Uh, then it goes on to um, the institution of the Eucharist itself at the Last Supper uh, as the memorial of Jesus' death and resurrection till his return and the way in which Christ has chosen to remain with us. And references, of course, which we've talked about, how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul all speak explicitly about this as a Passover meal, and then the command of Jesus himself to do this in his memory. So, and the, and the noting of the Catechism is when Jesus says, do this in memory of me, it is a memorial of his life, death, and resurrection, and his intercession and the presence of the Father in heaven. So it's a reminder or a memorial of all of those different dimensions. And uh, it also notes that this has happened since the very beginning as we're referenced in the Acts of the Apostles, which we looked at above all on the day of the Lord on Sunday, but also on a day-by-day -day basis. And it continues, it says, with the same structure to this day. So that's the whole little reflection on the economy or the work of God in the history of salvation. Uh, the, the, the fourth point it makes is it talks about the liturgical celebration of the Eucharist. And it's interesting, uh, who do you suppose it quotes in terms of looking at the structure of the Mass going back to the very beginning? So St. Justa, the martyr, we looked at last time. Yeah, so it quotes extensively from St. Justin as we looked at, uh, and it notes that there are two basic parts to the Eucharistic liturgy, or the liturgy.
liturgy of the Word and then the liturgy of the Eucharist, both of which form a fundamental unity. Uh, and then it actually goes through uh, the movement of the celebration, uh, kind of the key parts. And it speaks about that all gather together, uh, and it notes that the Pope is present at every liturgy in a certain way. That's why every Eucharistic prayer refers to the current Pope. Uh, the, the liturgy is properly the liturgy of the bishop of the diocese, even when celebrated by a priest. And that's why the bishop is also referred to in every Eucharistic prayer that we pray. And uh, then it notes that but all of God's faithful have active roles to play in the liturgy. And it spells out some of those active roles. Lectors, uh, gift bearers, communion ministers, and so forth. We could come up with more. But everyone who is present is, in some way, an active participant in what is taking place. Mentions the liturgy of the word, the presentation of the offerings, both bread and wine, and the collection for the poor, which goes all the way back to St. Justin in terms of reference. Uh, it mentions the Eucharistic prayer, which it says is the heart and the summit of the celebration. So if you think about the celebration of Mass, it's the Eucharistic prayer itself, which is kind of the heart and the high point of that liturgy. Where does it begin? It begins with the preface, Father, it used to be Father all powerful and ever living God, is still remember the old translation, which has the holy, 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 and it goes all the way to the great amen. So that is uh, the Eucharistic prayer. Three key moments when God's people were involved in that were the singing of the Sanctus, the holy, 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 the uh, singing or speaking of the memorial acclamation, and then, of course, the great amen that comes at the end. So, you know, it's the entire assembly is involved in those three pivotal moments during that heart and summit of the celebration. Uh, we are thanking God, and it's interesting, what are we thanking God for in the Eucharistic prayer? Uh, it notes three things. We're thanking God for creation, of which the bread and wine are part, we're thanking God for our redemption, how we've been redeemed in Christ, and we're also thanking God for how we are becoming holy by the work of the Holy Spirit, our sanctification. So we're in the Eucharistic prayer, we're thanking God for all three of those things. Creation, <coughs> redemption, sanctification. A key moment in the liturgy, we haven't talked about these key moments so much yet, but one of the key moments during the Eucharistic prayer, you probably notice, is when the priest extends his hands over the bread and wine and invokes the gift, the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in some form of, may the Holy Spirit transform this bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That is the moment known as the Epiclesis. It's very interesting in the Eastern churches, so the Byzantine tradition and so forth, they point to that as the key moment by the power of the Holy Spirit when the elements of bread and wine are transfigured. Now the Latin rite, which, which the Roman rite is part of course, um, we emphasize the words of institution, the words that Jesus himself spoke at the Last Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. And we say it's by the power of the words of Christ that these elements of bread and wine become his body and blood. So by word and by spirit, uh, those elements are transfigured. Um, they make Christ sacramentally present under the forms or species of bread and wine. Christ's body and blood, the sacrifice offered on the cross once for all, becomes present again when the Eucharist is celebrated. So this is kind of a overview of things I've mentioned along the way. Uh, the moment of anamnesis, when we recall his death and resurrection, was an element in the Eucharistic prayer of intercessory prayer. We pray for the clergy, for the living and the dead. We pray for uh, all of creation, the whole world, pastors of the church, and so forth. 
And then um, the whole movement of the Eucharistic prayer is toward the moment of the rite of communion, when we receive the Lord in his body and blood. So that's the very purpose uh, for which we gather. Uh, the fifth element, so I'm, I am moving kind of quickly, the sacramental sacrifice and the three elements noted, thanksgiving, memorial, presence. So everything about the Eucharist is praise and thanks to God, uh, memorial of the dying and rising of Christ, and his presence to us. So we offer to the Father what he has given to us, the gifts of creation, of bread and wine, that become the body and blood of the Lord. There's a beautiful quote, in the Eucharistic sacrifice, the whole of creation, loved by God, is presented to the Father. Isn't that a beautiful thought? When we celebrate Eucharist, so imagine that moment as the body and blood of Christ are being lifted up at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. The church is saying that we are, in a sense, we're offering to the Father all of creation when we lift up Christ and those sacred elements. It's interesting, God. Uh, Tehard de Chardin, the French kind of scientist, paleontologist, philosopher, theologian, mystic, he was a Jesuit, uh, he spoke about the liturgy of the cosmos and that sense that the universe itself is being offered to the Father at that moment of Eucharistic celebration. So you think about the cosmos God created and all of its majesty and wonder, the whole of creation, and all of it is being offered up to the Father at this supreme moment of giving praise and thanks to God. I just find that if you stop and think about that a bit, you know, we're doing something for all of God's creation and uh, with it. So the Eucharist, the thanksgiving for, the, for all that the Father has accomplished in creation, redemption and sanctification. The church sings the glory of God in the name of all creation, and it is possible only through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. So in that sense, Jesus himself, uh, risen from the dead, uh, and assuming the human condition, becoming part of creation, uh, assumes all of creation and lifts it up to the Father. The Eucharist is also the sacrificial memorial of Christ, of his body, the church. So it's a reminder that we too are part of this great mystery. Christ himself becomes real and present. And it references back to the whole Passover, the way that our Jewish brothers and sisters understand the remembrance of Passover, that they are now present at that event. So I spoke about that and the Catechism references that. The Eucharist is a sacrifice, it is the body and blood offered to the Father. Uh, it makes present the sacrifice of the cross. So only one single sacrifice, that of Christ on the cross and the Eucharist are one and the same sacrifice. It's only the manner of offering which differs. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said, the bloody sacrifice of the cross the unbloody sacrifice of the Eucharist. Now, here's one thing to a thought. Let me see if I can find this quote. It's worth reading directly.
that the body of Christ, referring to the church, participates in the offering of her head, which is Christ. With him, she is offered whole and entire. And this is what I like about it. The lives of the faithful, so it's all of us, all the baptized, the lives of the faithful are also offered whole and entire in the Eucharist. So when you celebrate Mass, when you come to the Eucharist, you're also offering your entire self to God. So we say that the bread and wine are Christ offered to the Father, the priest is, uh, or dead priest is also offering that sacrifice. But all of you, the faithful, are also offering your entire self to God in the Eucharistic offering. And it specifies that the lives of the faithful, including your praise, your suffering, your prayer, and your work, those four elements, your praise, your suffering, your prayer, and your work, those are all offered, are united with those of Christ and with his total offering, and so they acquire a new value. That means that the praise and thanks that you're always giving God, anything you're suffering in life, your prayer and your work, all of these things take on a new value because you offer them to God in the Eucharist. That's worth pondering, isn't it? It also mentions the whole church is united with this offering and the intercession of Christ himself, including the Pope, bishops, priests, deacons, those in heaven, Mary and the saints, with Mary we stand at the foot of the cross. So we're right there with Mary at the foot of the cross as we celebrate the Eucharist. It is also offered for all the faithful departed so that they may be able to enter into the light and peace of Christ. So there's this communion at the Eucharist not only with those of us visibly present, but with the community of the faithful in heaven and those uh, being purified of what we call purgation or purgatory. But it begins to speak about the presence of Christ uh, and the various modes in which Christ is present. And it notes that Christ is present to us in many ways. How is Christ present? In the word proclaimed, in the prayer of the church where we're two or three are gathered, Christ is especially present in the poor and the sick and the imprisoned, which he spoke about in Matthew 25. Uh, in the sacraments, in the sacrifice of the Mass, in the person of the priest, the minister who offers the sacrifice. But it says most especially in the Eucharistic species. So in those elements of bread and wine that become the body and blood of Christ, there is a uniqueness to that presence which is not to denigrate any of the other presences. So the Catechism says we call it the real presence, not to say that any of the other presences are not real presences, but to designate that there is something about this presence that is truly unique. So, in fact, we say that uh, in the sacrament of the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the whole Christ, are truly, really, and substantially contained. Real, and the word used is substantial presence. This is scholastic theology's attempt to use uh, Aristotelian philosophical language to express this mystery of what takes place in the Eucharist. That what was 
once bread and wine have now become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Aristotelian philosophy, uh, which St. Thomas Aquinas uses, uh, there are two different um, dimensions to, to, to things. One are the, what we call, that which is substantial, that which is essential to something, and that which is, and they use the term accidental, so outward appearances. So um, the best analogy I've tried to use in the past, it limps a bit, but if I go to Florida and I'm on the beach a long time and I get a sunburn and I come back to Tennessee, uh, somebody would say, you've changed since you went to Florida. Well, what kind of a change did I experience? It was not a change of who I really am, my essence, but that was what the scholastics would call a change in my accidents, um, an accidental change that is needed to accidentally happen. It might have intentionally got sunburned. It means that it's the outward visible properties of me that have changed. So when we talk about the transformation of the Eucharist, we're not talking about an accidental change, it's outward properties. So the outward properties or, or attributes remain those of bread and wine. That's why if you do chemical testing, uh, there's no chemical change, and there's no change in a, in a physical reality, but we would speak about, when you talk about substance and Aristotelian philosophy, you're talking about the inner reality, the essence of something, what it really is, and uh, that is what is transformed, not the outward forms. It's the inner isness of it that gets transfigured. So in that case, you have these television programs, movies that you've seen, where, you know, people switch bodies, you've seen those movies, and so like something, something happens, and now I'm, I'm, I'm really, I look like an adult man, but I'm a teenager, somebody else is now, I'm somebody else now. My essence changed, that's not an outward appearance. Well, of course, is it possible to change something that is essential, the essence of something, not in this world. I mean, that requires an act of God, right? So God alone can transform the essence of something into something completely new. So that's why we know it's the work of God, not a human work uh, that takes place at the Eucharist. So that's a bit of trying to put into philosophical language the mystery of what happens at the Eucharist. So putting into language when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, it's trying to give some rational understanding of what's going on. But St. Thomas, who developed this way of speaking, will say, but this change cannot be apprehended by the senses. This has to be, a, this is a mystery of faith. You have to accept it, faith. So there's no change in physical attributes. Now, and one of you is doubtless going to say, what about those Eucharistic miracles in the Middle Ages? Well, those would be special cases, right, of miracles where, you know, the host began to bleed or they could found heart tissue or whatever. So that's not what normally happens at every Eucharistic liturgy. So in the Catechism notes, this begins at what we call the moment of consecration. So that's for us when the words of institution are spoken, this is my body, this is my blood, how would you know that, that now this is not just bread and wine, it's become the body and blood of Christ if you're at Mass? Anything you notice happens after we utter those words. Sometimes bells are rung, but what's another thing you see? You kneel. Ah, the priest genuflects. <laughs> so going down on one knee is something, we only genuflect to God, right, to the mystery of Christ. So once those words have been uttered, then you see the priest genuflect. Now this is Christ. That's when it begins. And as long as the elements of the Eucharistic species subsist, so as long as there's still the elements of bread and wine, the Eucharistic presence is still there. So it doesn't cease to be. So what happens, for example, when you receive it in your body? Well, your body begins to digest it, a certain point, it's no longer bread and wine any longer. It's been digested into simpler elements. So, believe it or not, scholastic theologians try to figure out, well, how long does that take? Well, they thought it was about 20 minutes. So, you know, so they thought, well, for the first time, you receive the Lord in kind of a tabernacle of 
his presence for about 15 or 20 minutes. So, um, Christ is present whole and entire in each species and not divided. So fully present in both elements. Uh, and then the Catechism notes that one of the signs of the fact that we worship God now present in the Eucharist is in one of two ways. We either genuflect, which I just illustrated, or we do a solemn bow to the Eucharist. So both are signs of adoration for the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And you may also know that we, uh, even after the Eucharist has ended the celebration, uh, the, the Eucharistic elements in the form of bread are kept in the tabernacle. And uh, so the presence of Christ is kept there for solemn veneration. And sometimes we also, which we did this past summer, the Eucharist is carried in a solemn procession. So there are ways that we worship and adore Christ uh, in the Eucharist, outside of the Eucharistic celebration itself. Uh, and you can see um, with the tabernacle, the candle that is always burning there, that the candle is a reminder that Christ is present in the tabernacle. That's why if you walk in front of the tabernacle, or you enter the space where the tabernacle is, you normally genuflect or bow to acknowledge the presence of Christ in that place. Um, originally, for a thousand years, the tabernacles were not kept in public places. They were worn in sacristies, and the Eucharist was predominantly uh, kept to be taken to the second home bath. But the Catechism notes that over time, as our awareness of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist deepened, that we began to more and more adore and worship Christ outside the Eucharist itself. So for this reason, it says the tabernacle uh, should now be at a prominent place and a worthy place in the church so that people know that this is a sacred space within the church. I think, by the way, that the way that the tabernacle was designed here at St. Henry does a beautiful job with that. It has its own space, the beautiful I guess they're bronze covered doors or gold covered doors and uh, the tabernacle light above it. So it was a, you have that sense, you know, this is kind of the center of the heart, you know, of our, of our structure. Um, Christ, the Catechism notes, wanted to remain with us till the end of time. So this is one of the ways that Christ remains present with us till the end of time. I remind you of what St. Thomas said, it is apprehended by faith, not by the senses. Then we come to number six, which is the Paschal Banquet. Um, at the same time, it is both the sacrament of the memorial of the cross and also a sacred banquet of communion in the Lord's body and blood. Uh, the celebration of the Eucharist is wholly directed toward the intimate union of the faithful with Christ through communion. That's the very reason Jesus chose to become Eucharistically present, for us to receive him and to be led to that intimate union, which is with Christ the Lord himself in the Eucharist. The altar is a symbol of Christ himself and of his body, as St. Ambrose earlier on noted. So that's why the table of the Lord or the altar is venerated. You may notice that when the priest comes in at the beginning of Mass and the deacon, what do we do? We approach the altar and we bow. At that moment, at St. Henry, we're really bowing to the altar, which is a symbol of the body of Christ because the tabernacle is beyond it in its own reserved space. And then you notice the second thing we do is we come around to the altar and we touch the altar with our lips. We're reverencing the altar as a symbol of the body of Christ. Uh, and also, even at the beginning of Mass, you'll notice at times that we incense the altar because it is a symbol of the body of Christ. Uh, so important is the centrality of the symbol of the altar that in the medieval period they called the altar the axis mundi, the axis of the world. So the whole universe rotates around the altar because that is the place where the death and resurrection of Christ become present. So the altar has a, 
And I love the way that the altar was designed here at St. Henry because it's substantial, isn't it? The big marble altar. So when you want it, the church encourages the altar to be immovable. So you know you definitely have the sense when you walk into the church, what is your eye drawn to first? It is the altar. You know that is the great symbol of the Eucharist itself, and upon which Christ will be come present to us Eucharistically. So in that sense, the altar is the focal point of the celebration. Speaks about the importance of communion. Jesus did say, after all, take this and eat. Right? Not only this is my body, but take and eat. Take and drink. So we must prepare ourselves. And uh, that's why we must receive the Lord glorifully. So if we are aware that we are gravely and grave sin and we have cut ourselves off from God's love, and um, what we call mortal sin, deadly sin, where we have separated ourselves from the body of Christ, that we should not properly approach the altar uh, until we have been reconciled through the sacrament of penance. And also note that uh, the church has a, a fast before we receive the Lord in his body and blood. Currently, the length of that fast is one hour. So one hour before we receive the Lord in the Eucharist, we don't eat or drink food other than water or medicine, ordinarily. Uh, it also says, though, that the faithful should be prepared to receive the Lord Eucharistically by the right demeanor of our bodies. And we should dress mortally, our gestures should be worthy, we should have the attitude of respect, solemnity, and joy. Um, so and then it notes that the faithful should receive the Eucharist uh, on Sundays and feast days, days of obligation, when we're obliga obligated to be present at the Eucharistic liturgy, but also that we can receive the Eucharist uh, at any Mass. That's the very purpose for which Christ became uh, present to us Eucharistically. And, um, and so important is the reception of the Eucharist that the church requires us to receive it at least once a year. So that's what we call the Easter duty, uh, and preferably sometime during the Easter season. And notice that Christ is fully present in each of the species of bread and wine, but to have both is a more complete sign when it's given under both kinds. And it will note that the Eastern churches always receive under both forms. That's the ordinary way that they receive. You know that even in the Eastern churches, when a baby is baptized and confirmed, it receives its first Holy Communion as an infant, or, and uh, they do a little golden spoon, and it has a, a drop or a bit of the precious blood and a fragment of the host mixed together, and so the infant receives the Lord in his body and blood uh, as a baby from that spoon after they're baptized and confirmed. So we have um, we've covered a lot of what the Catechism says um, so far. Any questions up to this point or observations? I just had a question about, you know, there are other um, non-Catholic um, churches or uh, the faith that they have communion, um, but they don't, I don't think they believe in the transubstantiation. Is that correct? correct. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I will note that, that the word transubstantiation, the belief that the entire body and blood of Christ become present instead of bread and wine, uh, that was a, that has been the belief of the church from the beginning, but it's also a specific response of the Council of Trent to the argument that Martin Luther made, which he used the word consubstantial, not transubstantiation, to say that the body and blood of Christ are now present with the bread and wine. So, as if the bread and wine are still present, but the body and blood are present mixed in somehow. Uh, whereas we would say, no, the entire essence, what it really is, is now the body and blood of Christ, even though the forms remain the same. So, it's a subtle difference, but important. And John Calvin, so the more the, uh, to the uh, more or this right or left of Luther uh, would say that the sacraments are signs of realities but not the realities themselves. 
itself. So the Calvinist tradition and Christianity has that it's a sign of Jesus' body and blood, but not really his body and blood. So if you look at a lot of churches today, do they believe it's the body and blood of Jesus? It depends which church you're part of and who you ask within those churches. Some churches believe it's the body and blood of Christ, some don't. Now, what is the Catholic view about that? We believe that all the Eastern churches, like the Orthodox churches, um, that they have preserved a valid Eucharist. So it really is the body and blood of Christ. And all the Eastern churches believe that as well. The churches and the Protestant Reformation in the West, um, we question that whether they have preserved what we call valid orders. Even, for example, with the uh, Anglican Church, do they have to, were they continuous in the succession of the apostles and validly ordaining priests? So we are not certain, in fact, that, that what they saw for it really is the body and blood of Christ, even though it may be a sign of it. So, um, you know, that's the judgment of the Catholic Church based on what may have happened historically. Now, what they believe may be a different matter. Most Episcopalians and Anglicans do believe it's the body and blood of Christ and treat it with the same reverence we would. So, yeah, there's a spectrum of beliefs in the, uh, in the non Catholic world. Good question. Yes. Okay. All the Eucharist in the tabernacle comes from 
the Eucharist which was consecrated at a Mass? Yes. So is there anything that talks about how the bread, the strictness with it just being water and flour? Oh, so um, the catechism, and there's a, after you go through most of this information, it has a little summary at the end, and in a little summary at the end it says that the necessary elements to be used are wheat flour and grape wine. And so the regulations of the church for the specify that, that you know, the wine has to be uh, pure wine. It can't be, um, what's the word? Uh, other stuff can't be put in. You know, it has to be just pure grape wine. And uh, the bread has to be wheat flour for the Latin rite and water. So no leavening agents or other ingredients. So the host that we receive at Mass or pure wheat flour and water, that's all they have in them, the two ingredients. And then the wine we use is grape wine. And no that, additives, that's the word I was looking for. And that's rooted from the beginning. So that's rooted from the beginning in the Latin rite. We've always used grape wine and wheat bread that's been unleavened, so that's, that would, would have been that way for centuries. The Eastern traditions, though, have leavening. So they have leavened bread because the leavening is a sign of Christ risen from the dead. So the Eastern churches have leavening in their bread. So in a pinch, could we use masa? Um, I'm not sure what masa is made of. Is it, does it have just wheat flour and water? Yeah, it's just flat. It's just like a crust. Yeah. yeah, if it only has wheat flour and water, you could use it. I think it has a little salt. My okay, salt. well, technically, that would be what we call illicit, and we're not supposed to use it because it has other ingredients in it. Yeah. Uh, if it's wheat flour, it probably, would probably be valid matter, so it really would become the body of Christ if used. But that would probably have to be for, you know, some emergency or something. Right. So. And my in-laws had a cousin who was a priest in Germany during the Second World War. He was imprisoned in Dachau. Oh. Now, sometimes the parishioners could get some things into him. Mm. Exactly, I don't know. What? But he used to say mass. And he used to yes. Say now, you don't say mass because it's the wrong kind of wheat? Or what happens? I mean, are there, well, there understanding? You, you would minimally have to have for valid, for it to validly become body of blood for us. So you'd have to have a few things. You'd have to have a validly ordained priest. You'd have to have bread and wine. And you have to have the intention to do what the church does at the Eucharist. And the words of institution would have to be spoken. And the Latin, right? So, so those would be, you know. And I actually have heard of a priest, I think, in the Orient, and they would do similar. They would bring out a bit of bread, and he didn't have a chalice, access to a chalice, so he would use the palm of his hand for the chalice. And so the, the bit of wine would be put there with a drip of water, and he would hold it in his hand till he consumed it. So, you know, those are extraordinary moments in time. Where extraordinary things happen. But Jesus would have used wheat bread and grape wine at the Last Supper, right? That's the elements of the Passover meal. Quick question. So for people with celiac, then they can't receive? Yeah, with celiac, uh, now we do know that a certain percentage of the population uh, does have a pretty severe negative medical response to any form of gluten in the bread. So the, the two things we do offer now, we have extremely low gluten hosts that we offer, and uh, most people, even with celiac, have tolerated those fairly well. They have, a, they have to have a tiny bit of gluten to qualify for Eucharistic bread, but not enough that apparently it triggers an allergic response in the person receiving. Some are more severe in their reactions, and they will only receive from the cup. And we actually have a couple of people here in St. Henry. Uh, one of the sisters in our school can only receive from the cup. So remember that Christ is fully present in both forms. And you would have a real dilemma if a person could not receive either bread or wine, right? By health. That would be a really that would be really painful, right? So we have we do have something called spiritual communion, where you're not actually able to receive Christ physically, and uh, that's what we do in cases like that. Which brings up the question, what about like alcoholics? Do they just refrain from taking from the cup? 
Good questions. Other questions? But the intention is only for the priest, right? Uh, the priest or deacon can offer the faithful in tainted Eucharist, so that is one of the valid ways of giving out communion, but it has to be done by the priest, and it has to be dipped and put on the tongue. It may not be received in the hand, and the recipient can't take the host and dip it himself or herself. Probably, you know, the church creates all of its rules for certain reasons, and I would suspect it's trying to take great care of the Eucharistic elements, and so when you allow people to walk around the host and dip it, it creates opportunities for you know, dropping. dropping it and, and just the dangers that could be involved. And I would also add, just for health reasons, it's probably less hygienic to stick your fingers in the cup than to drink from it. So. Probably have more germs on our fingers than we do on our mouth. I don't know, but would our doctors agree with that thought? Amen. 
Yes, it is. True. And by responding to it, you assent to it. For you hear the words, the body of Christ, and respond, Amen. Be then a member of the body of Christ, that your Amen may be true. So it's just a beautiful bond. Um, and then um, it quotes St. John Chrysostom. Um, the Eucharist also commits us to the poor. So we must recognize Christ and the poorest, his brethren. St. John says, you have tasted the blood of the Lord, yet you do not recognize your brother. You dishonor this table when you do not judge worthy of sharing your food. Someone judge worthy to take part in this meal. God freed you from all your sins and invited you here, but you have not become more merciful. So the importance of if we receive Christ, we have to treat each other in the same loving way as parts of that body of Christ, in the presence of Christ and the poor and the hungry. The Eucharist is also uh, the source of the unity of Christians. So, and I mentioned before, because of the question, in the Eastern churches it's not really possible, but the Catholic Church would encourage it under suitable circumstances if it's approved by those Eastern Church authorities. With the Reformation, we believe they haven't preserved valid orders. Um, that's necessary to have the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness. And um, so communion with Protestants ordinarily does not happen except for an important or grave necessity, and they ask for it, and we have to be certain that they have uh, the faith uh, that it is the Eucharist and the proper dispositions to receive it with the approval of the bishop. So those are some of the fruits. Um, and the last little section, which is so short in the Catechism, the Eucharist is the pledge of the glory yet to come. It is an anticipation of heavenly glory. So there is no sure pledge or clearer sign of hope of the new heavens and the new earth than the Eucharist itself. So it's already pointing us toward the eternal reality that we call heaven. So that eternal banquet with God forever. It was interesting, I just had a funeral today of a woman who had lived to be 91 years old, and she was Italian, and uh, so one of the things the family said about her was that she loved food of all kinds and loved cooking, and she had preserved the foods of her native Calabria in Italy, and that whenever the family gathered for a holiday, it would always be an all-day affair, an all-day celebration, no rushing at all. And so I said, you know, uh, given the fact that that was so important to her, when Isaiah speaks about what God will do, Isaiah says, God will remove the veil that veils all nations, all peoples, the web that is woven over them, which is death itself. And on that day, there will be a banquet of rich, juicy foods and pure choice wines. I said, so we believe now uh, that the Lord has invited uh, this person into this heavenly banquet. So every banquet, every celebration we experience here in this world is a foretaste of that which is to come in the heavenly banquet. And the Eucharist preeminently, and then I turned and I said, and we are about to receive Eucharistic food from this table, which is our foretaste of the heavenly banquet. So there's a beautiful connection between the meals of Jesus banqueting as a human being, you know, those are festive moments when we have meals together, and the Eucharist and the way God becomes present to us, and the ultimate banquet of God forever in the kingdom. So, all right, other questions or observations? So this is just a little the theology lesson, lesson about the Eucharist or in this three years of what is celebrating the mystery of the Eucharist. So it's good to think about its meaning and significance a bit more deeply, isn't it? All right, so we have one class to go uh, this fall. That will be on the evening of November the 8th, and uh, that will be a more personal reflection, perhaps a little bit, of, the, of what's happened in the last 2,000 years in the history of the church. And uh, we're also gathering a little early. I think Margaret sent out a reminder by email for those of you who are on our email list. So that 
evening we'll gather together about 6.30 and we'll have a little bit of a, a meal celebration. So a little food and wine and festive gathering. And um, so that's kind of a fitting way to, to bring this particular <laughs> closure to think. So hope you all will be able to join us uh, that evening. So so let's uh, let's pause for a moment and um, recall with gratitude the gift that the Lord has given us in giving us his body and blood. Glory to the Father 